So I'm going to start off with an easy topic of conversation, which is love um, and the title of your record, Love is Dead. And I could see how some people in the press might be like, it's a breakup record and it has to do with romantic love. But listening to the record, it seems like you're kind of addressing a lot of different facets of love. And I'm interested to hear, you know, approaching this record, what you were tapping into in terms of love and, and those feelings. People always say our records are breakup records, don't they? Well, I think for like for us, I think we knew that naming this record was we wanted it to be bold and a little bit theatrical, and it's supposed to be a little attention grabbing. It's supposed to poke you to make you think about things, and we kind of think about it more as having a question mark or an ellipsis on the end. It's not a definite statement necessarily. It's just like a starting point in a conversation. But <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't think I have noticed that people always assume, as a, a female lyricist, that you're writing about. Romance. They think mm -hmm. that all the time, anyway. And I've noticed that was like when I read interviews of other bands, not just with us. So, you know, ultimately, I think it's up to people what they want to read into the songs, and if it means something to them, then that's that's ultimately what you want, you know. Um, that's not what it, it was written about from my point of view, but that doesn't mean that that's not what it will mean to other people, you know. And I think that with the lyrics of bands that I love, it can't possibly have been having the exact same experience as the person that was writing that song, and you find something in it emotionally and then you connect with it in a different way. And I think that's an important and powerful thing. Yeah, I mean, the idea of love in music, just that word is so loaded. It's either like love or death in music and literature, right? Um, and this or money. Or money, love, death, <laughs> uh, money. Or God. Or God. Well, yeah, I yeah. feel like they're like recurring themes over like centuries and centuries people have written about in, in, in music and literature and now in film and TV and stuff. You know, those are like parts of the human experience that we don't, really know what to do with. We don't have those things figured out. Mm. And we can control so many other things, but you can, can't control love and death, really. Mm -hmm. I thought that was... <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was interesting, because I feel like that's... That phrase is something you see, like, on the internet a lot, when, like, some famous person breaks up with some other famous person and... Oh, do you? Oh. I don't know. Like, I don't know. I'm <laughs> not on that part of the internet. Well, love is dead? Is that really... Yeah. yeah okay. Like, oh, oh, love is that's dead. That's such a like, cliche. Yeah. I know. Damn. No, I mean, it's an interesting, like you said, if there's an ellipsis after it, it's not a period. It's mm. a discussion of, yeah. like, that kind of feeling and emotion that's either romantic or God or for your country or... Yeah, and I think that the concept of love obviously exists in romantic relationships, but it exists in other, like, in every relationship you have. It's more about the idea of the way that you treat people and stuff. So we didn't write a relationship about celebrity breakups on the internet. <laughs> it was like, I don't know. Um, I think it was more about the, I feel like a lot of the record is about the fr like frustration and confusion and like sadness of knowing that things aren't the way that you thought that they were. And maybe you grew up thinking you were a bit of an idealist or an optimist and how do you try and be optimistic when you don't feel like that about things anymore, I guess. Did I sense there was kind of like a political bent to some of the songs, like Dancing um, on the Graves and, you know. I think Graves is probably the most overtly political in terms of the lyrical content, but I don't think that we made an entire record that's like no. political manifestos. It's more, we always write from a kind of personal point of view, and I think it'd be difficult to write about existing right now and not feel affected by those things. I kind of feel like when we're writing, it's always a snapshot of where you are at that particular time. and. Um, I think those things have seeped into some of the songs because because of the world that we're living in and, you know, we're not, like, 20 years old anymore, able to ignore stuff and not think about things and just be footloose and fancy-free, you know? I think that you have to be conscious and aware of these things and I guess that it was natural that that would come into the writing in some way. Yeah, I feel like every record that's coming out has... It's it, usually there. It's not always touched by the political landscape or what's going on in the world, but it just seems like it's it's hard to make music or make anything today and not be affected by what's going on outside of your own sphere and mm. relationships. I feel like that's how it should be, though, when it comes to art in any discipline, like you say, is that it should in some way reflect the time that it was made and the and the, the social environment, the political environment, and everything. You know, it's part of being alive, and art should reflect that. And it makes it seem more alive. It's not just a pop song that could come out any decade or 
in a year. It's mm. something that's like wrought from who you guys are right now and, and who you are in terms of music mm. and musicians. Yeah, I don't think it was a conscious thing that we thought about in advance. It more just kind of came about naturally during the writing. And I would say that a lot of the record is still very personal. It's so people shouldn't be worried. You're not going to get like us thinking that we're you too or whatever. But um, yeah, I think that does feel personal to us. Like someone that does feel personal to me right now. And I don't understand when people say, stay in your lane, like artists shouldn't talk about these things. I'm like, well, what do you think songs are written about? They're written about people's experiences and they're written about how you feel about the world, how you feel about each other, or they're written about politics and social politics and all those things. So mm -hmm. it doesn't, it makes sense to me that you should mention those things if they are what you're feeling at the time. I mean, the idea of staying in your lane as an artist doesn't really make sense considering. Any idea yeah. that somebody would be telling an artist what to do as from a listener's point of view, is absolutely absurd, mm -hmm. like to me. That's, I don't think anything of value gets made <coughs> by committee or user poll. Like, certainly not artistically, not in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Certainly not something that I would stand by and put my name to, you know? Um, I'm sure there's loads of records that are, you know, even sequenced by focus group. Like, they're really yeah. successful too. It's just doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just doesn't, I, mean, I can't imagine it feels great to make something like that, but it depends what you're making. Maybe it does for some it, people, what you're it for, just yeah. not for me. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, that seems like the kind of music or art that's not gonna actually make any kind of impact. It's like filler candy, mm -hmm. you know, like something that's designed to have a specific effect as opposed to mm -hmm. something that's gonna set trends by itself. And I feel like you guys, you know, you might, work in a style of music that like the 80s kind of synthesizer um, style that's that's popular but it's not following something that's come before really. Well yeah and I guess that as much as there are retro elements to the sound because of the keyboards that we're using the instruments that we're playing it on like when we started making that it was more just because that's the instruments that you guys have been collecting and you wanted to try primarily writing on synths instead of guitar and I guess that was before the kind of uptick in those sounds. Mm -hmm. Like most, when we started writing, we were like more influenced by like you know witch housey kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that's the difference is that we were just trying to write good songs and think about like in a classic pop songwriting rather than chasing a trend or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I think there's a lot of snobbery in music from both sides. And to me, I don't. I don't like it when we do interviews and people are like, slag off this massive pop rock set song or like slag off this or insult that because I do think that there's a lot of, if it was really easy to write these radio chart radio songs then people would do it all the time. Like they'd be able to do it really easy. And I do think that, you know, those songs do connect with people because they're talking about things that are relevant and they, they feel something and they can like immerse themselves in that or they can escape from something with that. And I think it's snobby when people in alternative backgrounds, like alternative music backgrounds, act like that's not, well, that's not good because it mm -hmm. was like, it was on the top 40 radio. But then equally, I've definitely spent a lot of time writing, trying to make stuff more alternative and more obscure because you don't want it to be too mainstream. And I don't know, I kind of feel like, I don't really believe in the idea of like guilty pleasures. I kind of feel like life's too fucking short, you know? Like, why don't you just like what you want to like? It connects with you for a reason. So as a listener, you should go listen to what you want to listen to. And then as creators, you should create what you want to create. And you're doing those things for a reason. So just go live, I think. Yeah, and like you said, it's hard to write a good pop song. Like, yeah. there are people who sit there and try to write a pop song, and it doesn't work. But the, the ones that succeed, succeed for a reason. It's not. I'm only ever trying to write songs that I like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I, I'm not trying to write anything else, unless I'm trying to write for someone else or a really specific reason. Someone says, I need a song for a top 40 radio. It's not gonna be like us in a room doing it. Mm -hmm. Cause it's not what the project is about. Yeah. Maybe you get a song on top 40 radio and that's cool. I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. But your relationship with the style of music and the way that you write begins and ends in the studio for this band. And it's and it, and it's completely governed by our own taste and how I 
what we want to sound like. Like, I don't... It's weird that n none of that stuff, all valid, what Lauren was just saying, ever comes in. It doesn't even come into my head for one minute when yeah. we're writing. And I think that's important. Like, that's all stuff around the music business, around other people. A lot of opinions that people will have across the board of every artist. But that can't be a part of your creative process. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you would never get anything done. Certainly nothing good. Well, you find yourself tied up thinking about a release before finishing a song. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. thinking about your t-shirts before just you have a song. Stole. It's just no way to live. You just, you're miserable. You'd be miserable. I've tried to do it before. Mm -hmm. It was a, f a failure. Well, like, and I wasn't surprised that it was a failure. And it was a miserable experience, you know? The first thing you have to do is make yourself happy in the studio and get excited for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you, one day after that, once the song is done, you can maybe get excited about whether other people will gravitate towards it or they can enjoy it in the way that you do. And that like expression and communication ha is intrinsically at the core of, of all music, if it's you know successful, but then depending on what your barometers for success are. Mm -hmm. But you can't let that get in your head when you're writing, otherwise, you go insane. I can imagine. Mm, it's really, really difficult. Well, I mean, you know, any artist who's thinking too much about what people will think of their art, you know. It's never good. It's not good, and you're not going to create something. You might create something good, but. You know, it's, I think the times have changed as well. Mm -hmm. I think it's much harder now to get away with that sort of behavior than it was even 20 years ago. Mm. Like, especially in Britain, we, we lived through, as children, as uh, uh, through like Stock Cake and Waterman, <laughs> that whole thing where it was genuinely as simple as finding like a hot toot and finding a decent track. And it didn't really matter if they could sing. And you could get, if you put spent the right money in the right place, you get it played and then that was that. And, and I don't think it's as simple as that anymore, by any stretch. Mm -hmm. There's, because people have way more access to every single part of the story. And people are also obsessed with hypocrisy in, in social media, in the media in general. They're obsessed with the concept. Mm -hmm. And they're waiting at every juncture to destroy someone. So like, you can't, it can't be as simple as that anymore. Yeah. Every single part of the story has to check out. I think it's an interesting aspect of how things have changed <laughs> in the last 10 yeah. years even. You're not allowed to change your mind, God. Oh no, you, no. Can't, you can't have an opinion on something today and change your mind in, in five years. Because mm -mm. like someone will find your tweet. Or... Yeah, it's, Absolutely. it's incredible to me. It's actually amazing. That said though, there are a lot of, uh, when you go back and dig out people's like racist, sexist tweets from like however many years ago, I'm like, oh, well, maybe you've changed and you've grown, or maybe mm. should have deleted that shit. Yeah. I think I'm talking about art artistry or like, oh, oh, okay. or like uh, just it's not general human, human opinion. I don't yeah. mean like hate speech. Okay. That's, I mean, that's different. Well, people can change and they can grow, and that's things. And I think that we should grow up and we should learn. So maybe... Yeah, I don't know though. If you do, I, I reckon if that was ever your stance, stance, you're probably a fucking asshole. Well, I remember they, I seeing when people found like Blake Shelton had done a lot of quite homophobic posting and then he was like, I don't feel like that now. I'm like, well, hopefully you've grown and you've changed. Yeah. Or maybe you just wish you deleted that shit. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And I was like, we're all fine place. with this. This is okay. Okay, yeah. never mind. Hmm. Well, I guess maybe in terms of, of musicality and like, Keeping consistent on brand opinion, all that stuff seems yeah. very weirdly guess, important. Where like if you put that same on onus brand. on David Bowie, it would, you know. Well, and I yeah. kind of feel like as a as a band, as writers and stuff, you don't want to make the same record again and again and again. Yeah. And then if you do, like if that's what feels right to you, then cool, do that. Like mm -hmm. I feel like you just kind of have to listen to each other. And if it doesn't make you happy, then you can't expect it to make, you know, if you don't believe in it, how do you expect anyone yeah. else outside mm -hmm. of that to believe in it after the fact? So I guess you just kind of have to just block out, don't go on the internet, block <laughs> off the outside world and just make do your decisions. Yeah. Yeah. People just want to feel a part of something, actually, is how I see it. 
like, and it's a lot easier to criticize something, to feel community out of like destroying somebody. It's called dragging, I believe, mm -hmm. at this point. <laughs> dragging. Yes, and uh, oh, that's the uh, cool. it's a lot it's a lot easier to feel community community in somebody's destruction as than it is to like celebrate something because yeah. you have to put yourself out there even on that little level and I think a lot of people are afraid to do that. Yeah, because somebody will tell you that whatever you like yeah. sucks. You, or, uh, you, yeah. that, your opinion sucks so therefore you are not valuable yeah. as a human being and that is not a nice thing to hear. No, I think but, everyone should just like make it a practice to tell artists yeah. that they like that they like something because I don't think you hear that enough. You hear mm -hmm. people like, like you said, dragging and then people, you know, jumping in and um, defending somebody, but you don't mm. hear somebody just tweeting like... If you don't stab me, you're going to drag me. Yeah. That's the, <laughs> there's nothing in between. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, speaking of your own... Like, Do you know, it's funny that, sorry, I don't, okay. this is actually really negative and it sounds like um, this has got anything to do with me or our band. Should we get down on this couch? No, I think, I think <laughs> it's, it's actually not like that for our band and I, we receive a, lot of, a yeah. lot of positivity and that's awesome. I think it's just more the way I'm speaking more as a listener mm -hmm. and an observer of culture than anything else. I don't even think I'm talking mm. about the record at yeah. this point. No, or I'm definitely not talking about our band at this point. Cause well, yeah, I mean, I totally... very peachy. I understand what you mean. I, I get frustrated sometimes and I wonder if people even like music, like mm. the way that some writers and critics and stuff talk about music, like gleefully reveling in a record that's yeah. maybe not their favorite record yeah. Yeah. instead of being like, okay, well, Maybe this isn't yeah, the record for me. Mm. We were talking about that like earlier today. Like, mm. I do feel like the nature of media and stuff has changed a lot in the last five years, the last ten years. And I read a book once that was called the I can't remember what it's called. It was like the rise of snark culture, and mm -hmm. they were like as like TMZ and stuff became more popular. Then that it's kind of chicken and egg. Did that influence media, or did that yeah. exist because people wanted it to? You know what I mean? And then I kind of feel like that makes it harder for any kind of constructive discussion to happen mm. because, I don't know, I have no fear to say I think like TMZ is one of the fucking worst things that's ever <laughs> happened to humanity. Mm -hmm. It's just awful. It just encourages like cruelty and like voyeurism and like, it's like it's horrible the way that they talk about people it's, and the way they treat people. And, yeah, it's, it's, just yeah. Them. it's not just it's, them, but they yeah. like cornered the market and popularized It's just video tabloid journalism, it's the it's same gross. thing. It's yeah. just the medium that's changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, people that when the Sun newspaper mm. or like the, all the red tops in the UK, sure, not as much of a thing here, but they really ruled all print in the UK for many, many years. It's what most people read. This is to me exactly the same thing, but the medium was different. Like there was no such thing as a, a video on a cell phone or can, internet connections mm -hmm. weren't as fast mm -hmm. to distribute media. And that way, or you can take a DSLR down to the scene of somebody's mental breakdown and have mm. it on the internet in 10 mm -hmm. minutes. Like, you had to write about yeah. it. You had to put it on a page with a picture, and that was how people found mm. out about it. That obsession was always there. Yes, and the point is that people people want it. Yeah, people, but they then want it's hard to know. It's like, does that inform the way that we are with each other, or is the way that we are with each other why that exists, you know? Maybe. And I'm not saying I think we should all sit around holding hands and singing Kumbaya. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, Maybe there's, a way, no. there's a way to, like, be with each yeah. other that's not yeah. that. Yeah, and that's I think the that very extreme. A lot of the internet is a bit like that. You kind of, I think it's much. I don't know, and I've noticed that I do it too. Like it's easier to say out loud something negative than to say something positive, because mm -hmm. it's just more yeah. of a conversation starter. And people mm -hmm. don't react yeah. to positive things right. as much. Yeah. They'll so. react more to like well, a I funny see. photo than a new yeah. song or something. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. I had to ban myself from looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, all feedback like mm. of, to, of our band because whenever we release something I become obsessed with it and I could read pages of positivity and then one literally one negative sentence by one person was enough to really really destroy mm -hmm. uh, like confidence or any kind of idea that like what we were doing was what we should be doing because you can't change it at that yeah. point, you know? So I, I just don't look at it now. Yeah, it's the only thing. Because you can't change the way that people... I think people are entitled to their opinions yeah. and they're yeah. entitled to do what they want to do. But I guess it's different from when we were growing up because you can, you like now have direct access to mm -hmm. people to tell them 
how much of a piece of shit you think I am. <laughs> and I'm like, if you, can, if you want to think I'm a piece of shit, that's cool. I don't need to know that. Mm -hmm. You don't need to. You don't get to like say that to my directly to my face. And they and probably I guess think you're the, not reading it too. They're probably like, no, or, oh, or don't care. And then should you care? Probably not. As a person, maybe mm -hmm. it'd be nice if you cared, but you don't. You don't have to. And I think like I guess we just need, like you have to learn your limits, kind of, because people want. Like I want to, as a writer, say stuff like be genuine and be authentic, and people want artists to be the most like vulnerable, sensitive, heartbroken people in the world. But they also want you to be when people are like, well, but they chose to do this, so they should be ready to eat shit when I tell them to eat shit. And yeah. I'm like, well, that's fine, but I'll just stay off the internet. <laughs> the only difference between now and and um, a long time ago is that you you have to be all that, but you have to be available 100% of the time, and that's like quite bizarre to me. Mm -hmm. It's quite odd. You mean like in terms like of? of access, like you have to be, like if someone can't access a, like a fan pre-sale, you have to be there to say, I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. And that's great that people are interested in, in what you do and what, uh, that, but it's, at the same time, it's the relationship between artist and fan has really evolved. And you can't be available 100% of the time. You you just got to go watch Riverdale. Yeah. It's got stuff to you do. You have to be asleep sometimes also. <laughs> and sometimes, you, you know, you have to go to the shops. Yeah, and also <laughs> be with your like, loved ones. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You have to go out and like have a life. You have to live. Mm -hmm. That can be really difficult if you get sucked into that. Got to go buy socks. And it's very easy to get sucked in. Got to go pick buy up all laundry. sorts of shit. <laughs> so Sorry, I don't have a washing machine in my building. I have to go around oh, the corner. No one does. You're no. in New York now. Yeah. Got to go down the street. <laughs> I left and my the phone The timer doesn't work on the thing. The timer's like, the timer says 30 minutes. So I'm like, I'll just come back. Um, and then I'll wait exactly 30 minutes mm -hmm. and I get there and it still says 12 minutes. The, are you talking about the dryers? We yeah. go to the same laundromat. Yeah, the dryers <laughs> take slightly longer. The washing machines themselves are quite longer, <laughs> but the dryers take a wee bit longer. Anyway, yeah, so no. that's why we can't respond to I know, that's why I that's can't why be responding all the time. I'm busy as shit. We got to the washing machine. Yeah. Yeah. The washing machine. <laughs> Good Understandable. That's yep. the something of the New York bands yeah. have to yeah. deal with now. Keeping it real, guys. So working on this record, I mean, after two previous records going very well, obviously getting a lot more feedback online. <laughs> what was like, was there any different challenges with this record than previous ones with the expectation of the third? Only self-imposed ones, really. Yeah. I think that the, um, and there's all obviously lots of kind of challenges that come up over the course of making any record, personal ones, creative ones. and. The, um, and you, you just tackle them as they come along. But uh, to me, this was a really fruitful time, this album. I don't know if I've had as much, like I was really invested in this one in a way that maybe I was able to disconnect in the past. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed so much of it. But then again, it was also a year of my life making it. So you can't be happy all the time. Yeah. And you can't be, when you just live for a year, but you're also working on this project for a year, it's, you, the project experiences every version of you. Mm -hmm. So that's not always like the easiest thing in the world. So there's lots, there's logistical challenges. Like I was away from home for, for the first six months. I hadn't really moved to New York yet. And uh, that was tough, but. You still had your own washing machine? I mean, I could wash whenever <laughs> I liked, all clothes any day of the week. But the thing, the, the thing about it was, you more than anything, I know you do, it's terrible. In a way that you never used to. No, I still do. <laughs> the thing about it is you... It's run out of shreddies and you're screwed. Shreddies <laughs> does not translate. Shreddies, no. uh, shreddies is a slang word for underpants. It, oh, shreddies. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. If you run out of shreddies, then you... Then you it's pretty niche. You know, if you have a machine in your house, you can be like, oh, I'm just going to pop a wash on. Mm -hmm. You don't have that option. No, you you've got to go out it. there and do it for a couple of hours. Maybe buy underwear. Number one I don't know if you've had to do that yet. Shreddies. Shreddies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, man, I do my yeah. best work when I'm in fresh shreds. True that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, help, we'll help you do all your work in fresh shreds. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, it depends. When we're on tour, sometimes this is too <laughs> Oh, Chris, I don't want to know. <laughs> Never a fresher pair of shreds required. Keeping the dynamic <laughs> fresh is the most important part of making an album. Yeah. It's the greatest challenge. <laughs> Good way you saying me, but you were like, much like the shreddies, but the dynamic must be kept. A fresh shreddies, fresh dynamic, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, at least we can still, it's kind of nice, we can still make each other laugh about dumb underpants. Yeah, you guys seem pretty, in, that's good pretty chill with each other. <laughs> oh, that's fine, that's good. 
So you guys brought some other people in though mm. this time around. You did. Um, Jack the Shreddies first. <laughs> You calm down with that one. Uh, that's uh, that's really that one. I'm not sure that one's landing, but uh, just in case, in case you're wondering. <laughs> it's like, I think people need that some even feedback. heard that phrase oh, no. before. Yeah, I did get like quite late last night. I mean, not <laughs> oh, yeah. from travel, not from oh, like yeah. Yeah. being on the rest. Or whatever. Yeah, we, mm-hmm. we yeah. just we just had an idea that um, for this time we would experiment with working with some like because we did the first two records entirely on our own, like mm-hmm. writing, producing, and all that stuff. And uh, we thought we'd just give it a try. If it worked, great. We would, you know go down that line, but if not, then also totally cool, it was just an experiment. Yeah. And uh, one of the most fruitful ones, like the initial sessions we had with uh, Greg Kirsten, uh, we were like, okay, we need to, you know, see what else is is, is happening here, because it was just such a dynamic um, collaboration. It almost felt like he was just one of one of us, you know, mm-hmm. an amazing keyboard player that suddenly joined our band, you know, fantastic musical mind. Um, but yeah, we worked with a few different people, but um, a lot of them didn't make the cut, um, but the, the Greg stuff really, really did. Yeah, it kind of, I mean, it sounded like you guys, but it sounded like slightly different. I, I'm, mm. not, I'm not sure how to characterize that, mm. but um, I think there, there was some press somewhere that said you were guys, you were going for some kind of more like universal feel. Is that accurate? Or did the, I think it's the interesting. Just... I think yeah, uh, stuff kind of gets gobbled up <laughs> yeah. and then like spat back out again, and Game it ends up telephone. some other version of what you were trying to. I don't think we've ever used the word universal. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. But what we were trying to do was just stay excited. Yeah. Like and Greg offered this kind of insight to what we were doing, or this particular opinion on what we were doing that was really interesting to us, and he was and he kind of basically joined the band. And whereas we had this really, we were really protective over the dynamic the three of us had. Once there was a fourth voice in the room, sometimes that went really well and sometimes it went not so well. But with Greg, it was just electric. Mm -hmm. Everything was electric. Everything felt great. It felt fun. There was like, everyone was dancing around the studio. And I mean, you know, from a personal point of view, that you, when you're that excited, maybe you're onto something. Yeah. And that's that was the all the stuff that informed the direction of the album was just really, because that's the majority of the album was just how those sessions felt and the energy of them. And whenever there was like the studio was buzzing with earth hum of different keyboards and everything was plugged in, we were just really in the moment, writing spontaneous, spontaneous, spontaneous. And Lauren was writing lyrics faster than we've ever she's ever done. And that's kind of my enduring memory of it. Mm. We, not that we, there was never a point where we thought, How, okay, album three, what are we going to try and achieve with this? You yeah. know, like we never, mm. it was never a conversation. It was always about our excitement levels, always about our investment levels. And that's how we ended up working with Greg for so long because we were so excited and so invested and in, based on what we were doing. Mm-hmm. In terms of that excitement, was there one song or one moment that kind of coalesced for you this that this was working and that this was, you know, a good direction to go in, that you got the most excited? Um, well, I guess the first the first day in the studio with Greg, we wrote what ended up being Get Out. So, like, that mm. opening riff for Get Out was one of the first things that came out. And, um, yeah, I feel like that definitely felt exciting to us. Mm. It felt like it fitted into our world, but it felt like it pushed things a little bit further. And um, I don't know, I think after that, everything felt quite natural, really. Um, I think it was about that whole, there was like, we did four days, and I think Mm. we wrote Get Out, Never Say Die Forever in the first three days. Mm. At which point, those are kind of like, those are three of the songs I like the most. I think that really kind of made me, got my energy levels to a point where I was obsessed with the idea of working with them. Mm. And I feel like each of those songs is quite, different in terms of like what it's influenced by like mm. forever is probably the most like straight up could be played by like a garage r- garage rock band kind of vibe and mm-hmm. never say die is kind of post rocky weird at the end but it's got this kind of and really irrit- irritating pop hook in it and i don't know i feel like after those few days we were like okay we can write a good cross section of stuff that we're excited about across the board with this guy rather than feeling like you're having to make one kind of thing over and over mm. so 
it was an exciting start. Well, mm. thank you guys so much. Thank and you. Yeah, thank you very Records nice. coming out May 25th? It sure May 25th. is, yeah. Awesome. Get it. <laughs> get, get it. Get it now. Get out. Get out. <laughs>